Okay, Alan, I know it's a bit creepy, but I had to Google you, and something I found that was quite interesting. You're a bit of an actor. Tell us about the Bromley Boys. Yeah, um, of people who follow me on Twitter, it is in my bio. It, it's obviously there as, as much of a joke as scoring the last goal at Highbury, because I'm not really a part-time actor. I was offered part-time... Well, I was offered a part in a film. I don't think I'll be offered parts in, in any other films. But The Bromley Boys was a film, or is a film, that um, was made about a non-league club in the division that I worked in for a long while. It happens to be the club that my dad now supports after him supporting Chelsea and getting annoyed with all their money and thinking that he wanted to go back to grassroots. So he's a season ticket holder at Bromley. And it just so happened that there's an extremely uh, well thought of book in non-league circles called The Bromley Boys, which sells incredibly well. And it's just one man, Dave Roberts' account of supporting them when they were the worst team in the country. And it happened at a time when England had just won the World Cup. So if you can imagine the whole mood regarding football in the country is everyone on a high. And this young kid supports the team that's actually on the biggest, lowest of the low. And the book, uh, received uh, uh, you know really good reviews and was optioned by a local filmmaker called TJ Herbert and he always had this idea that he would take the season that Bromley had had and not word for word Dave's words because no disrespect to Dave it just is an account of him telling what he bought on the way to the you know way to the game we had a kick out on the train we lost 2-1 so I don't think that would have made a good film but the concept behind the film as in Bromley having a terrible season but everyone loves football in the country because England has just won the World Cup was something that the filmmaker wanted to put out as a story uh, I think the script was written uh, by one guy where they didn't quite get the comedy angle and then it was passed to another guy so I was just asked to look at it because I was working in non-league football at the time and also there's a betting element to the to the film if you if you watch the film and you should um, and they just asked me to sense check the, the non-league stuff within it um, I mean I wasn't around in the 60s obviously as you can see but I, I checked out the the season that Bromley had had and the way that the games actually uh, came about and the, the location for where the film was going to be shot because Bromley Stadium has been redeveloped beyond recognition from the 60s. And I was so involved that by the time they actually got a cast in place and the script had been changed by Warren Dudley, the, the guy that wrote the, what actually became the film script, um, I was asked to actually go and listen to the actors read it to see if there was anything else I could comment on. And it was pretty much thrust upon me because I went down to Soho um, on a lunch break, and uh, extended lunch break, I must admit, and I was there <laughs> and they said to me, do you, do you want to actually read this part that's in the film? Would you like to uh, take pages 50 and 56? There's a part of a local reporter. Instead of you just listening for, for an hour and a half, do you want to just, uh, when it comes to that, do you want to give those two lines? And I gave them, and at the end of the read-through, the casting director came up to me and said, do you know what, you could probably do that role. So I said, really? Said, yeah, you, you could do that. So, you know, with modesty, I said, all right, yeah, I wouldn't mind, get in touch with me, and they did. And uh, say so Betway gave me, um, two days away from the office um, to go and film with uh, the crew on location. It was down in Swanley in, in Kent because, uh, as I say, Bromley's ground couldn't be used, so they used a ground down in Swanley in Kent. And I spent two days in a trailer with actors from films and comedies and TV shows that I'd sort of grown up watching or even watched as an adult, and it was great to be involved for two days. But I tell you what, I. I I don't think I could do it. I, I enjoy my own job too much, and that might sound sort of a bit boastful to people saying, bloody hell, you know, what you would turn down being an actor. But uh, in fact, sitting around in the trailer, once you've gone through all the conversations, it is pretty boring, and you go into makeup for an hour or so, and then you're dragged out to give a line that lasts two minutes if you can do it in one take. Uh, a lot longer if you can't and then you're off and away and you don't really see much of the story going on you're not particularly involved and by the time you watch it on the screen it doesn't really feel like the day that you had so I loved it wouldn't swap it for the world um, 
but I, I think it will stick as part time and probably my only film credit. But it's out on DVD. It did really well in the cinema until, unfortunately, they were hit by because of the the heat wave. People just weren't going to the cinema, so the the sales and the, the sales of tickets dropped off. But it's got some really good reviews. Really enjoyed doing it. And uh, EastEnders producers can put their darling finger away then. <laughs> well, look, I'll take each offer on a case by case basis. Right, keep sticking on the, the non-league football uh, angle and a bit more serious, well, a lot more serious. Uh, once again, my creepy Googling, I found an article that you've written uh, a few years ago about the um, corruption in non-league matches. Now, I understand you want to tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, I, I, I always think it's an interesting subject. I mean, to give you the background, my, my second PR job in the industry actually combined two things that you know I've, I've really enjoyed doing. Obviously, it was for a betting company. And then it was the first ever betting company that was sponsoring a, a non-league division, and that was that was the conference. So Blue Square took that on board in the 2007-08 season. Um, Sporting Bet had just moved to Guernsey; um, they wanted uh, traders to relocate. I didn't want to leave my uh, son behind in uh, in London. There was no way I really wanted to do that. Although I didn't really have any other offers to stay in London. And again, it's just one of those things, a bit like the City Index advert, sometimes at your lowest point, and I, I firmly believe this, I'm not into stars and fate and things like that, but I also believe that sometimes things can just hit you without any kind of planning whatsoever. And uh, it was actually a recruitment agency phoned me and they said, that, I can't see it anywhere on your CV. Do you know much about non-league football? I said, yeah, I've been any time, anywhere I've ever lived, I've always gone to the local non-league club and always been involved, kept in touch with it. I've even compiled uh, for non-league. Uh, they said uh, there's a company that have just sponsored a non-league uh, division and they're also a betting company and there's a real specific requirement to know about the prices. Uh, we want to put you in touch with them. And when I went to the interview, it was actually at Blue Square, and they said, look, we're, we're sponsoring the, the top three divisions in non-league football. We've also got a media deal with Satanta, which means that we will have someone on the touchline as a touchline reporter to actually talk about odds. So this was the first and, and possibly last time it, it'll ever be used, because I guess now there's, um, I suppose, Obviously, football and betting do go hand in hand, but I don't think there's the, the, the clamour to promote it too much from a broadcaster's point of view nowadays. But Satanta had that freedom in 2007 and said that the Blue Square reporter will be a, a thing. So uh, it was amazing. It, it was an amazing job to just be thrust into, um, working with 68 non-league clubs and also going travelling around all of these clubs on the live matches and they, and they showed about 60 a season I mean BT Sports show it now it's only about 20 a season 60 to 80 games a season we were travelling from York to Torquay back to Exeter and, and all over the country uh, as a TV crew and um, it was amazing and I would um, the, the key thing that they needed was someone that can make up the prices before they actually loaded online so the goal would go in during the match and I would have to come up with what the new prices would be and they'd have to be reasonably in line with what we were just about to release online as a company and um, obviously you needed a trading background to be able to know that the four to six favourites just gone one nil up in a goals expect expectancy game of, of 2.8 goals if they've just gone up one nil up in the first 20 minutes what does the four to six nil become and um, I'm by no means going to say that I'm the best at that but I could do it to a degree of uh, failability that was enough to be on air and um, give those prices. And so they would throw down to the touchline and I would be there with a the microphone and, and say, right, okay, you know, Weymouth have just gone one nil up in this game. They are now four to one on. If you want to back the away team, they're now eight to one. And it was, it was great. It was great to be able to do that. Obviously at that time, or about a year and a half after that, there were lots of rumours that, that, that non-league football did have a corruption problem and that came to a head at the end of 2008-09 season where Forest Green Rovers played away at Grays Athletic and on the Saturday it was actually the Racing Post that flagged up that three companies had sponsored, uh, suspended the half-time, full-time betting in that game 
which was uh, one team to be leading at half time, the other team to come back and win, which as most people in, in football betting will know, is quite a high price double result market. Another thing that people in the betting industry will know is that you don't really take that much on that market, especially when it's a, a non-live, non-league game on a, on a Sunday. It was the final game of the weekend, so it was moved to a Sunday, and we were actually at Torquay, where Burton Albion were trying to get over the line. We'd already paid out on them. We'd gone 100 to one on, paid out on them in March. They limped over the line to the extent where Cambridge could have stolen it off them on the day. Cambridge and their chairman delayed the kickoff, I guess on purpose, to see what was going on at Burton uh, away at Torquay. And I remember the Torquay physio chatting to me on the sidelines saying, what's happening at Forest Green Greys? And he, he not only told me what the score would be, he told me who would get the first goal. And this, isn't, this wasn't the days of smartphones giving you a, 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 a goal scorer pretty quickly on an, on an alert. He told me who would score the first goal and how it would be scored. And lo and behold, uh, at half time, checking on the BBC website, he had it exactly right. And the guy didn't even have, he didn't, he didn't have the internet, he didn't have the phone anywhere near him. And obviously something very drastically wrong had gone on there. And I confidently said on Radio 5 that there was fixing in that game. One of the managers involved in that game subsequently told me that I was 100% correct and there was fixing in that game. And uh, unfortunately, the, the, the authorities just didn't have enough to tie it together. And uh, Blue Square lost a lot of money on that. And uh, I think it was William Hill as well. And uh, I know that you've interviewed Graham Sharp, but he was at the forefront of trying to get that to more prominent. But what then happened was, because that came out in the media, people were looking for it everywhere. And earlier in that season, I think uh, it was uh, Weymouth were playing um, a game against Russian and Diamonds and what had happened in the local area is that the players knew that their insurance was invalid and they weren't going to risk their careers so that Weymouth were going to play a youth team. Now to me that's team news and insight, that's not fixing. That youth team from Weymouth went out on the pitch that day to go and win against uh, Rushton and Diamonds. They weren't capable of doing it and that's why they got beat, I think it was 8-0 eight, eight or 9-0 on the day. But anyone that was ahead of that team news, I think they won money fair and square that day. But then obviously the FA had to tighten it up and say that the insight into team news is also an offence being passed on from any employee within the game. Um, I think that's a bit draconian in that if you've got a non-league player in the National League South, he may have played in the second round of the FA Cup. He's not going to be playing in the final and his season is actually over by then. Um, by the time the FA Cup comes round, pretty much you know, 90% of the National League South clubs have finished their season by then. He could well be sitting in a, a pub with his mates and the FA Cup final could be on. The current legislation prevents him from having a fiver on um, the first goal scorer in that game. You might think that's right. I, I think that that is wrong. I think that uh, as long as that guy's not betting on anything he can influence, uh, it, it should be OK that he can bet on the World Cup final, the FA Cup final, things like that. But I do also understand that the FA have to say it's blanket, it's overall, because how do you police it otherwise? So they're in a very, 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 very difficult situation. There are, there are far more sinister fixes that have gone on in the non-league game in, in recent years, which, which also came to light, which involved you know, players being moved around to, to fix games and also being moved countries to fix games. And, and you know, there's enough proof out there on enough websites to say that, that that did happen in non-league football. I like to think it's a lot, lot cleaner now, but you know, sometimes you see a result where you raise an eyebrow, but I think it's like everything. You, you do have to trust that the vast majority of people are honest. Okay, Alan, we've given everybody a great insight to your, uh, your job and your um, history in the game. I always like to ask people, what advice would you give anybody watching this, young lad or lady? He fancies following in your footsteps, um, in a nutshell. I think in a nutshell, it's a lot harder now. Um, I think people might watch this video back and say that a few lucky breaks occurred whereby I managed to get myself into an industry that I wholeheartedly wanted to be part of and, you know, have loved every day. And, and, I, and I mean that, I, I don't think I've ever, uh, not many people can say this, I think in the last, you know, 20 years, nearly 20 years I've been in the industry, 
I don't think there's been a morning I've woken up and say, I don't want to go to work today. And if you can have that, then it's an amazing thing. I don't think that the path that I managed to get there on uh, is available to anyone anymore. I don't think those lucky breaks exist. I think, <laughs> you know, there are HR people in companies now that won't let an interview where you say, I'm an Arsenal fan pass as being uh, a, requ <laughs> a required uh, qualification for, and the only qualification for going there and getting a position in a company, however junior. So I think you just, it's, it's all about education. It's about getting a degree and following the right path. And there are decent opportunities open to um, people in the betting industry. But what I would say is, and I think Graham Sharp touched on this in his interview, there are probably only 50 people that have ever done this job in the history of the world. You know, actually being a bookmaker's PR person, um, you know, it's, it's not a widely known role or job. Uh, so, as I say, I think there's only about 50 odd people that have ever done it. And to, to the, the roles exist, and obviously they, they exist uh, across uh, all the companies, and including some of the bigger companies that have a whole teams of PR um, uh, positions, which would mean that there would be junior positions within that. So, I would aim at one of those, not specifically going for uh, the PR role, but certainly to work in the industry, get an understanding of the industry, and who knows, something lucky might happen. Someone might not turn up for work one day, and you might get to uh, put your hand up and give an interview. Okay, and I'm pretty sure that Betway's uh, senior ranks have breathed a sigh of relief that you're not going to be heading off to Walford. But so, what professional ambitions do you have for the future? I'm not so sure about that. Uh, we, the uh, certainly not on any on the acting side. Again, I'm not someone that's ever sort of planned out and said, right, this is my career map before me. I think a lot of things just happen and just, uh, for want of a better phrase, rolled with it. I would say to continue working at, you know, what is, um, I've found to be, you know, one of the best companies I've worked for, if not the best. Uh, you might say he's only saying that because of the position he's in. Um, no, I, I strongly, strongly agree with that. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting industry to work in. And uh, as long as I can continue to do that in any capacity um, that's either senior to or the same as this PRO I've got here, I think that'll be good enough for me. Great stuff. Alan Alga, thank you very much.